All right, this is Joshua Burkholtz. Uh, he is the author of a sought-after book, Fundraising Analytics, Using Data to, to Guide Strategy. He's a principal at Bentz, Whaley, and F Flesner. That works. And uh, founder <laughs> of the analytics service, DonorCast. Uh, he's widely regarded as a leading innovator in the 21st century development strategies. You guys are in for a treat. Uh, please welcome Joshua. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Well, this is a pretty this is a pretty awesome room to work in. I like this stadium seating. You know, just wish we had some popcorn, right? Um, it reminds me of an opportunity I had to speak at uh, Princeton for a Mark conference. Are any of you at that Mark conference at Princeton that was in the theoretical physics uh, building? There was like a chalkboard that Einstein had lectured at, and I had to like do a diagram of chalkboard because I felt so cool. Um, well, this is this is kind of like that kind of I guess. Uh, but thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I know when Chris asked me to speak, he asked about just talking about predictive analytics and nonprofit fundraising, really kind of introducing the topic, how it's used, and so forth. But I also realized, scanning the crowd and in advance, that a lot of you probably are already quite familiar with predictive analytics, how it's used in fundraising. So I am going to talk about what's happening right now in the for profit sector, what's happening in the nonprofit sector, and what's ahead, and some of the new things that I'm seeing in uh, predictive analytics applied to nonprofits. Um, and I think back. I guess my first national conference that I spoke on predictive modeling and so forth was about 11 years ago now, actually. It's been some time. Uh, the names keep changing, though. When I first started, uh, I did a lot of regional things. I'm from the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. and did a little local things, APRA and so forth. Um, the names kept changing. It was KDD and decision support systems and then operations research. And then we started to really embrace the term data mining. And that lasted for a few few years. And I'd say probably the analytics world uh, word took hold, I would say, around 05, 06. Um, and I, I blame Tom Davenport. I think he, when he wrote Competing on Analytics, that kind of became the new word for all of this. And it seems today, now we're hearing just new terms, data science, big data. A lot of the, the mathematics are the same, but the inputs are different. And how we apply it is different. We've all become a little bit more sophisticated. And, and user tools, I, like they're at our fingertips. I, uh, a lot of you know I have a bit of a music background. I have a daughter who takes cello. And sometimes I soapbox about pedagogy and statistics. And it, my one thing I'll say is, when my daughter studied cello, how many of you are familiar with the Suzuki method? OK, so um, if, if you are or if you have a kid or you yourself took Suzuki method, you've heard twinkle, twinkle way too many times uh, that any human should. Um, but what's fascinating is they basically put an instrument in the kid's hands, and they get them making music, even at a very young age. And they show that I can make sound out of this instrument, this violin, this cello. And then they learn the theory and why that works and how to make better music with, and through technique and so forth. Um, but the reality that I can make music out of this instrument precedes the theory. My little soapbox about mathematics education statistics is now we're at a point where the user tools, the software, is more accessible where we can actually mouse click our way through a predictive model, probably everyone in the room. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be a good one, but you can actually do it. Like, you can click through with the software. And I encourage people to try it to get, get going, because only through doing that, then you're engaged, like the child learning the violin, that you want to learn, why does this work? I want to learn why I want to test for collinearity, or I want to test my variables, find out what's proxies, and, and things like endogeneity versus exogeneity. But that flows out of, I already know I can do this. So I'm, I'm very excited, and I'm a big believer that everyone can do analytics. Maybe not everyone should. Um, but, but but definitely everyone can. <laughs> so anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit about predictive analytics and nonprofit fundraising. Now I'm going to go back to Tom Davenport. Tom Davenport wrote uh, predictive, or Competing on Analytics, several other books since. A lot of you are perhaps familiar with him. But I bring this quote up because I used to show it all the time in 06 and 07. So I thought it was really interesting. He said, analytical talent may be to the early 2000s what programming talent was to the late 90s. He was predicting back then that we were going to have a big demand for talent, and it was going to be a, high, a top performing uh, profession. And certainly that's the case. A lot of people say MSA is the new MBA. Uh, Master Science of Analytics are getting higher starting salaries on average than a lot of MBAs coming out of business schools. It's a very uh, good field to be in. Then I'll take a little bit more recent quote from someone who I admire quite a bit, um, Mr. Hal Varian at Google. Uh, 
and this is one of my favorite quotes, I keep saying that the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians, and I'm not kidding. Now, I wish Hal would talk to my wife and convince her that the stats is really sexy, but um, until that point, until I get Hal and my wife talking, I'm just have to go, I trust that indeed it's a sexy profession. But let's talk about what's happened with these predictions. Are we really at that point? I'd say I think we are. A recent Guardian study showed um, that two-thirds of people of, of, of major companies thought that the uh, actual supply or the demand for talent will outpace the supply for data scientists, that we're not going to have enough data scientists for the need that's out there. Um, and this is a pretty ubiquitous study. A lot of people quote this quite frequently. But also um, a Wipro study that maybe you've seen this one as well tried to go sector by sector and try to measure the impact analytics has had on the bottom line. And now this is it's a busy chart. And I want to mainly focus down kind of in the bottom portion right here. What this has is in this light blue, it's a productivity increase. I'm not sure that Tufty would love this whole slide, by the way. He's a little bit too busy, but anyways. Uh, we've got the productivity increase attributable to predictive analytics um, in percentage. In the orange, we have the sales increase in dollars and estimate um, by sector attributable to analytics. And so what we have is retail credits 49% of their productivity increase over the time period, which I don't recall off the top of my head. And um, I believe it's almost a $10 billion increase that they attribute to integrating predictive analytics. Now, I know a lot of my intro into it, I was at the University of Minnesota from about 97 to 2004 before I went into consulting. And I learned a lot from the retailers in our town. I happen to be in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where uh, we've got two big retailers headquartered, Target and Best Buy are probably our two biggest. And we, there's a lot of people there. And, um, and I always wanted to do what Target did, but I also had to remind myself they had 85 people in their marketing analytics department, and I was one at the University of Minnesota. Um, but nevertheless, they were doing some pretty amazing things, uh, which I'm going to get into a little bit more detail coming up. Um, segment by segment, clustering initially some traditional market research applications, moving into even process and supply chain. But consulting, air transportation, construction, Davenport's prediction that the industries that are succeeding respect of their success uh, sector would be doing so on the uh, basis of predictive analytics has certainly come true. Uh, if you point to the leader in almost every sector, it's also the leader in predictive analytics. Amazon overtook Walmart in retail. Amazon's arguably the leading uh, predictive analytics company in retail. And you can just go right on down the list uh, throughout that. So it, certainly, it's made a big impact. Now, a lot of us perhaps had our first exposure to predictive analytics with Fair Isaac or your credit score, perhaps the oldest one, the oldest predictive model applied that, um, that if you told your parents what you do, they'd actually understand what you're talking about. I kind of do credit scoring for, for nonprofits. Uh, and what was interesting about it is the application has really not terribly uh, been too much different in one aspect. When I've looked at the implementation of predictive analytics to prospect identification and pipeline feeding, it's very much the same way. Um, Fair Isaac realized that underwriting is a very expensive process. To research a name, to find out their assets, their likelihood to actually pay back this loan costs a lot of money. And some people got loans and some people didn't. If we can pre-vet before we're even giving that name to underwriting, and if they don't have a score over, say, 600, we're probably not going to clear them anyways. What we're doing is maybe one out of 10 of those would have been cleared, but nine out of, the, of, of 10 would not have. So if we narrow this down pre-underwriting, we know that we're doing the underwriting process on those more likely to be cleared to begin with. What they did is double the output of their underwriting, even more so than that. Now, that's very similar to prospect research offices, which are very much like underwriting. Research is, I think, one of the most important professions in this industry because it provides a risk assessment for the major gift team. It's pre-vetting and pre-qualifying before we go see a name. You know, if we go out to a name that uh, it's going to end up being a false hit, actually, it costs even more money to go out and visit someone, and that was a wasted trip, especially if you're traveling. Some have argued I've seen between $1,000 to $5,000 per visit is what a discovery call costs. So if we can do pre-discovery call research and vetting, that saves a lot of money. But as we developed analytics programs, some of the initial starting points in the early 2000s of applied predictive analytics to nonprofit fundraising was applied specifically as a pre-prospect research activity. Can we, like the credit score, say, here's the names that we think would make it their way through prospect research, so that researchers actually doubling and tripling their output. Um, what's ended up happening is we've had to invest in more and more researchers because we're getting more and more names, and it's actually been a really exciting thing. But that's been really an entry point, and I think a really valuable one, where we've seen return on investment going on a decade now, and some that are just getting into that. Fair Isaac kind of kicked that off. We were having discussion over dinner last night, or actually over drinks last night, trying to the gentleman from Portland State, are you in the room? So maybe not. So uh, one of the things also in the insurance area 
I'm on an advisory board of a for-profit company, unrelated, um, but one of the other board members was someone who headed up analytics at Fair Isaac for almost 20 years. And we were talking a little bit about, in the insurance industry, um, he was talking about how Progressive jumped out ahead. And what they found is actually, you, you, you all know the Progressive, all the, I mean, they're, you know, Progressive, Geico, they're all fighting over Super Bowl commercials. But what Progressive did is they were the first to say what competitor prices would be, and they would um, actually show when their price was actually higher than the competitors. Well, that higher price was actually a fictitious high sometimes which is what a lot of people don't realize. They calculated that certain customers actually cost more money through their predictive modeling. And actually, if they got them as a customer, based on their standard profile, they, um, they would actually lose profitability. So what they did is they had the predictive model so that when you filled out your form online, the model ran dynamically, and if you showed up as someone who would actually cost more money, it actually gave a higher price than the competitors to ensure you went over to a competitor and cost them more money rather than yourself. I mean, that's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> but it's, I mean, that's it's kind of game changing. It's, now it's not unique to Progressive anymore, but that was just kind of a, a beautiful use of applied data for profitability. Um, perhaps the more commonly uh, talked about in the last year was the pregnancy model at Target. You all remember that? That was, a, that was lots of fun. Um, <laughs> uh, for those of you that weren't familiar with that, um, the reason it made the news was so Target had a model that predicted when women may or may not be pregnant, and if they were, they would t send specific uh, marketing messages towards pregnant women. I, I don't remember lotions, uh, prenatal vitamins, things that a pregnant woman might purchase. And the way it made the story, I don't know if it's so urban legend, but it was in a lot of the major newspapers uh, not quite a year ago at this time, was um, apparently a, a father of a teenage daughter had complained that his teenage daughter was getting this marketing from Target. And it turned out Target had figured out she was pregnant before her father knew. Um, <laughs> so that's why it made all of the press and, and all of this. And a friend of mine, Ben Klingbeil, who's over in the uh, marketing analytics, actually said they're still running that model. They've not stopped modeling. But what they've done is they've been more creative of how they market. So it's not so obvious why you're being marketed certain materials. So it's embedded with other things. Um, and now a lot of us, you know, especially with prison, and all of the other areas where we're a little bit nervous about big data and data science, uh, which I would just point out most of our nervousness is rarely about statistical analysis. I mean, you never meet anyone who says, you know, I just think you know, statistical an analysis is of the devil. It's usually all about data acquisition and your source of data. But nevertheless, um, our industry being a little bit challenged um, ethically around doing data crunching, um, even though with all those concerns granted, a lot of us are kind of thinking, wow, well done Target, how'd you pull off that model, right? <laughs> it's, it's still some amazing science. Um, Netflix is the other one that perhaps we, we, we've seen in the for-profit sector. Um, obviously the Netflix challenge, which we're all familiar with, where they put the million dollars on the line for anyone to beat the consultants. All of us consultants were shaking in our boots, like, is everyone going to do this now? Um, fortunately for us nonprofits, we usually have a million dollars for the contest. So we're still employed, so I'm excited about that. Um, but what they did is they had the different teams, and um, the team that finally won was paid a million dollars for beating the predicted model or consultants by 10%. We're familiar with that. Perhaps we're we're less familiar with um, how much predictive modeling went into House of Cards. And maybe most of you already know this. I can't quite read the room. You guys all seem like you're dozing a little bit from lunch, so I'm jealous. I'd like to be doing that right now. In fact, that first picture of Bioshock, I'd rather be sitting at home playing Bioshock right now. But my second favorite thing to do would probably be speaking right here in front of all of you. So I'm just, full disclosure, Bioshock's a pretty sweet game. Anyways, moving on back to predictive analytics. House of Cards, uh, Netflix was trying to determine what types of shows were most often streamed, and even binge streamed was the term I think that they use, where you just sit down and watch a whole series over a weekend, and a lot of people do that. Um, they, they had a high percentage of people that like binged a whole season of Walking Dead before season two, like the night before, like the day before they watched the whole season. But they were studying binge um, streaming shows and what was most popularly streamed, and they created a predictive model. I don't remember the method. Um, that they used for it. I would assume it'd be a probit model of some sort. But anyways, what they did is, is they found six or seven top predictors and they decided to craft a show around their predictors. Um, here are the, are the different components. So it seems like remakes of British shows, check mark, certain types of actors. Uh, so they, they went through all these premises, like let's design all of a show. Now there's still art because they still need writers to write episodes and actually make it a good show that actors have to act. But, the, but they had several components that this was one of the first shows that a predictive model actually launched. And they've done it again with Orange, Orange is the New Black was also based on predictive analytics from what I understand. So that's fascinating. So it's in retail, it's in how we get loans, and we're seeing it 
in our entertainment. And certainly we've talked about Amazon, and uh, it's, everyone knows that Amazon does affinity modeling and so forth. What I think is the most fascinating contribution that Amazon did for us is actually looking inside. And I don't think they get enough credit for that. Because most of us in the data science were completely dependent outside. Now, I'm ne never one to say go away from outside, but you should add inside to it. And what I mean by that is we used to have data, we'd overlay it with external geodemographic stuff, maybe from credit houses, cluster data, maybe prism codes, personal clusters, what have you, good stuff. But then we would say, all right, people that buy this product um, tend to be in these clusters, these clusters live in these zip codes, let's market to these zip codes, we make more money. That was kind of a traditional applied um, market research, applied stats approach. And Amazon started to say, well, let's, let's actually look inside our organization. People that bought this book buy that other book, because things that people do at Amazon is more predictive of what people do at Amazon. I mean, and it seems like, yeah, well, yeah, of course. Um, but we weren't really thinking about it that much. And now we are. We're saying how they give at my own institution is predictive of how they're going to give in the future. It seems like my really big asset wealthy donors seem to have different patterns than those that give out of their income. One thing that I, I often see is income-based donors give very regularly. It's often very calendar driven, same time each year. It's motivated by their budgets, their cash flow. Probably the internal monologue is what can I afford to give when they're getting that direct mail appeal or when they're having a phone call or what can I actually afford philanthropically. And so they give regular levels, regular amounts, regular times of year. Oftentimes people that give out of their appreciated assets actually give out a different sequence. And it usually seems to time around markets or liquidity events. So all of a sudden we see a different time in the year, atypical or asymmetrical patterns. And at the same time, we're also seeing odd numbers, which is more likely if you're given a portion of, a, say, a stock sale or a portion, of, like a percentage of a liquidity event, suddenly you see an odd number, like $536 on April 16th. What, what's with that? Or I'm just throwing out some random numbers. So seeing those odd numbers can actually be predictive that they might actually be given out of a asset that they've uh, liquid, liquidated as opposed to a regular cash flow. So even little things like that, looking how are they acting at my organization, is that predictive how they're going to act in the future? And that's just one of like uh, infinite examples. But the inputs definitely do keep expanding. We've got more data. A lot of it is probably more trying to figure out how to organize and flatten data, put it in a way that we can model it. Certainly there's a lot of market products out there to do some of that work and some that are really exciting. And I see that as a, a future movement of what's going to happen for us is how we're going to be able to integrate, categorize, do better uh, work with free text, unstructured text. I mean, to this point, we've not actually had a lot of unstructured text, so there hasn't been a huge demand. We've had the contact reports, but since a lot of the origin of predictive analytics in nonprofit fundraising has been around prospect ID, the ones that we actually have contact reports are people that are already identified as prospects. So what's that going to do for us, right? Oh, this person's really likely to be a prospect because they said this in the contact report. Like, well, yeah, if there's a contact report, they're already an identified prospect. But what we're seeing is now that we've moved past prospect ID towards um, different behaviors, respective of clusters, some of the process modeling, different return on portfolio types of exercises. Now that unstructured data is starting to become relevant. Why this versus that? Who's more likely to give scholarship versus capital? Is this prospect more likely to get a gift closed by this gift officer or that gift officer? And what can we find from the unstructured record? So there's a lot more inputs that are going to come. So the for-profit sector, we've seen it cross-sector. It's a top talent. Uh, if any of you are at universities, a uh, good bet is half of you have started new master's programs in analytics in the last three, four years. Um, so it's a real popular field to be in, and, and it's working everywhere. But I'm also convinced that we're actually not that behind on as a sector. You always hear the nonprofits lag the for-profit sector. I've seen enough evidence to say that in a lot of ways we're ahead of them in some things. Sometimes we're behind. Um, there's great for-profit companies, those I just mentioned, they're doing amazing things. And there's others that are, have done their first survey monkey survey. It's, it's crazy uh, on the, the big differences. But there's amazing stuff happening in the nonprofits. What I mostly see, though, is in these four areas. Prospect identification, no question. Uh, predictive modeling, a lot of this starts from the vendors connected with screening to in-house programs. Um, higher education and healthcare seems to embrace prospect identification analytics before the other nonprofit sectors. So you're more often seeing those rise out of prospect research departments. Outside of higher education and healthcare, so in environment, human service, uh, so uh, global nonprofit NGOs, et cetera, you're more likely to see it around segmentation on the direct marketing pool first, perhaps migrating over to prospect ID. But that tends to be the origin in the nonprofit sector from what I've seen. Um, the annual giving segmentation has certainly grown. Um, several of my clients where we've started analytics 
of departments originally around major gift identification are now doing just as much work, if not more, around segmenting for the annual fund. Who's our most likely first time donors from our patient population or our alumni population? Or who of our members or season ticket holders are more likely to become regular donors to us? So a lot of that kind of segmentation has, has certainly been in, in place. Um, an area that I like to call report engineering, which we might not call it that, but now that we're having a different lens of looking at data, we're starting to understand what KPIs actually make sense or cause different things, and we're starting to actually engineer the reports. Now, there seems to be a line of delineation from those that do full-time report writing and the analytics departments, which would maybe set up a template or a format. Here's maybe the things we should, almost like engineering the design to give into the, um, to the uh, production designers. But there's some aspect of report engineering. And then the fourth area is the campaign forecasting, looking at past inputs, results, um, and then forecasting that in the future. Now, the forecasting is, um, we, I think one of the bigger challenges there is you can't just apply fancy algorithms and expect that that's going to predict your campaign goals. Um, it, it often does below a dollar point. As we all know, giving at a lower level is actually pretty predictable. That line's probably $25,000, $50,000 gifts or below. I bet you can predict, cut that line. You could probably predict, even just using a logarithmic um, uh, average moving forward, probably within three to four percent of what it's going to be over the next four or five years. But above that, we all know it's completely volatile and not very predictable. Um, maybe at some of you that that line's higher and you have more predictability based on the maturity of your program. But that volatility based on past giving is not predictive. However, what I have seen is gift officer behavior is enormously predictive. You might know not know what a donor's going to do, but you might know what that gift officer's going to do. You know who's in the pipeline at what stage and their probability of close, their close rate, um, what their close rate is respective of a certain cluster. So I know I've got this $5 million prospect. What are my odds that that gift closes with this gift officer? That can produce better than looking at the last 10 years of giving and see if there's a $5 million gift. So what we're starting to see is some evolution and digging past just past giving to predict future giving to actually look at pipeline tracking portfolio data to, uh, uh, to predict that based on the gift officer behavior. I think that's been really exciting and a, and a, a big evolution. And I love that I'm at analytics offices and I talk to analytics folks who are now asking for memorandums of agreements, studying pledge arrangements, when the payment schedules are going to be. Um, and it's not just actuarial tables and deferred gifts. They're actually looking document by document over a certain dollar amount. And that's important stuff. You, you got to know that. <laughs> if you're going to predict it, you have to really internalize it and get that domain knowledge uh, really solid. Uh, but also, to go back to Davenport, to get real value, analytics needs to move from a one-time craft to an industrialized activity. And that's, I think, perhaps more of the set of status of our nature, um, industry right now, is we're seeing a lot of one-off projects, but we're not quite fully industrialized. There's a few exceptions. I tried to put a maturity model together, and I'm really not an artist. And so at a visualization conference, this is perhaps a little bit dangerous. But I'm going to try to walk through, through this. Um, so these are completely fake and arbitrary. I just wanted to create some nice bumps, because I thought it looks cool. Um, but the conceptual framework is we spend a lot of time just trying to convince people to do it, this light blue area. And then over time, we spend less time convincing. This dark blue is the, um, how important analytics is to our program. So that kind of um, is inversely correlated to our time spent convincing, right? That's common sense. Where we see in terms of across the bottom is, is usually kind of the evolution. Perhaps you first outsource a project. Maybe you've bought from a screening vendor or an analytics provider. Here, build some models for us. Help me find major gift donors, find planned gift donors, so forth. And perhaps then you've moved into some sort of in-house. Maybe it's just a point-based engagement system initially. Maybe you're building a predictive model, some basic regression. Uh, you're trying out some different tools, something that's connected with another software platform. Then you might move to actually a full-time employee. And now we've got a lot of these. I'd say there's probably, uh, I would say, 80, 85 universities that have full-time analytics staff right now at this point. Um, and it's growing because we're starting to see teams now, which I'm really excited about, beyond um, uh, just like one person who's kind of the token. Yeah, that's our analyst. We've got that check mark. I'm a, a good executive, good VP of development. Do you have analytics? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, they don't know, well, I'm not going to go into that. I love VPs. <laughs> They're great. They're my favorite. Tell them all how much I love them. OK, so the partners, though, is perhaps the next step where other people in the organization outside of the analytics area actually really get it. Now, perhaps for a lot of you, that's where you're at. Like, you, maybe you're a full-time person now, but not everyone is really getting what you do. They think it's probably cool. It's probably some science stuff. Yeah, that person does that. I know that's important. I'm not really sure, too. I need that. 
that helps me. Um, uh, that help, and it's not everybody, it's usually a few champions, but someone starts to embrace it and say, actually this data helps me do my job better. It helps our organization do better. We actually see some positive results. To moving into something that's truly integrated, where we don't even think about a business process without having analytics be part of that. Um, and there's a few maybe are there, and then I'd say maybe we're moving into actually we're truly visioning and being transformative with analytics. And maybe it's the for-profits, Amazon, Netflix, those are those that are really, I think, transforming, changing the game based on it. Meanwhile, there's different stuff we're doing, perhaps segmenting, prospecting as we go, uh, portfolio optimization, performance tuning. Um, there's been a lot more portfolio work that I've been doing than I ever have been in terms of let's actually study portfolio of each gift officer and let's think about rebalancing just like we rebalance funds. Like does this person have the right mix of prospects to maximize their return? What's the right prospect for the right gift officer? Does this one close better with this cluster, this one with that cluster? Um, what are the, the different uh, levels that help us predict who's a, who's a likely candidate versus, versus not? Into some of the performance tuning, tweaking our KPIs, all the way through some of the automation and machine learning. Now machine learning I think is probably overkill, and I also like to remind people that um, don't aspire to be, <laughs> well I mean it's great to aspire, but also think about some of these things, I mean Amazon's got 100 plus people doing analytics, and if you're one person, it's all right if you're not doing the same thing they're doing. It's, it, have peace with that. It's, it, you're, you're still good. You're valuable. So our industry is definitely maturing, and I'm trying to put a maturity model. It's in the early stages. But there's also some new ideas. And, uh, and I put this one up because it, new ideas, I'm always slow to them, but then I jump in full steam, just like I am with a new doctor. Like, the new doctor comes out, and I'm like, nah. Matt Smith, he's no David Tennant, but by episode three, Matt Smith's my favorite. You know, and so hopefully it's the same with Peter Capaldi. This is really important stuff here. I hope you realize. <laughs> I mean, we got a new doctor coming out. It's number 12 officially. Depends if you count the war doctor. Let's not get into that. Um, okay. <laughs> so what are some new ideas that are happening? Well, one is our business is starting to become big business in a certain sense. And I want to define what that means, because big business is usually a negative term. But if you think if you're a local grocery store, um, you get successful, maybe you open another grocery store, then you're starting to open several more. Um, if you had each grocer reaching out to find their own products to stock their shelves, keep track of their own inventory, come up with their own market strategy, et cetera, you're actually probably missing out on something. Because once you get several stores, they start to realize, actually, we've got strengths in numbers. We can do consolidated purchasing and get better prices. So let's all go to the same, and with the strength in numbers, we can negotiate a good price. Or we can have a central inventory office that, that realizes this product moves well in this store, this product moves well in that store, this product doesn't move anywhere, and they're keeping track of what's working and what's not working. There's a, almost a, each, so a, an inefficient chain would have everyone doing their own thing, an efficient a big business usually has integrated processes, and those efficiencies are the key to the profitability of conglomeration. Well, fundraising, we're an industry that just keeps getting bigger and bigger, but we're not yet big business. And one of the keys to big business is that we look at our systems of inefficiencies and try to make them efficient. I mean, it, it seems like common sense, but a lot of us aren't doing that. We're just adding, let's just add more gift officers and they can do the same old thing. But what does that mean? What is an integrated prospect identification process? Where we're looking at all the names in our database and saying, here's the appropriate flow that we're feeding and we have the right spigots and we've got the right tuning. Um, we have um, uh, uh, actual inventory control. Like, uh, I'd say prospect management's an inventory job. I don't know, you can call it whatever you want, it's inventory. I, I th and I think that's a cool thing because we're, we're uh, observing that what products are moving or what are not moving. I'm sorry to reduce prospects into products, but we're keeping track of the portfolios and how are we keeping track to make sure that's the case. It's the inventory control. And we're starting to see kind of an integrated, holistic view to a business process where if you talk to most people in nonprofits, um, uh, and I often just ask this question, I mean, ask any of you in the room, like how does your university raise money? Money, you'll probably start by actually saying what you do. And that's what most organizations do. Everyone knows their job really well, but one holistic view of this is our strategy for how we build our base, we convert that base into major gift potential, we maximize that potential through these processes. That holistic approach is not fully there yet. So that's something that's happening, and I think through the data we're starting to un uncover what those efficiencies are. Um, I like to say a strategy for every name on your database. This is something every analytics professional should have as, as a goal, which is every name on my database, we're gonna do something with everybody. And sometimes that choice is to do nothing, but that should be a choice, not a default, that this just happened to us, that we didn't get to it. Like here's the segment that we think the best thing is to do nothing. Here's the segment we should do this. Now as we get narrower and narrower, it gets more complex. But have a strategy for every name on your database. Um, I think another area is talent analytics. 
Now, this is a growing area. I've done a little bit of work with this in the for-profit sector. I met with some of the folks at Target Retail. They have about 350,000 employees, so it's a really fun data set. Um, but they were trying to figure out who's likely to be a future leader in their company. And they had very specific categories of leadership qualities, certain moral traits, uh, taking responsibility for actions, being forgiving, compassion, et cetera. Um, and also profitability, making lots of money, and all of these types of things. And can we predict um, earlier on someone's career path that this person has the characteristics of those that are successful executives so that we can identify that career path sooner from the screening data? Um, lately, my, my firm, we've been doing some research on gift officers, gift officer retention. Um, not just what keeps a gift officer there, but we've been trying to add a different spin on it, um, adding performance to it. Because we don't want just a gift officer to stay for a long time, we want someone who raises a lot of money to stay for a long time. Um, and those that don't, uh, be happy to go someplace else and do the job hum hopping over there. And so we've been trying to study what actually matters to the high performers in their retention versus what matters to the low performers in their retention. Because a lot of our things are based on just overall retention things. Like one thing I found is actually a lot of career um, or professional development activities matter more to lower performers. Now maybe that's a good thing because they want to perform better, um, but uh, we, we haven't seen it as much as the top performers. There's a lot of non-intuitive results. Some things have been intuitive, like um, actually embracing the mission, which I always thought was sort of, yeah, we all have to have a mission, we have to embrace it. Like, that's what every good consultant should say. Let's have our mission, we can spend a day sorting that out. But we all sort of thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's actually true. Those that buy into the mission and really say what this institution does is really valuable, that's really key to their performance. And you can test for that. Um, uh, some of you know the associations people make, their friendships, et cetera, all, all matter in retention. Um, but there, I think there's more to, to that in terms of the analytics which is actually trying to predict what's the, so we talked about portfolio, a lot of our focus is on prospect identification. I think staff identification makes a lot of sense too. I'm trying to understand the profiles, learning the success ratios, um, what is a way to actually help shorten that learning curve? What are the key things that a gift officer perhaps needs to be trained on earlier on? Because this is a problem that if this doesn't happen within the first six months, uh, they have a hard time. Like maybe it's just narrowing cultivation timelines. Maybe it's uh, gift levels, um, help with targeting. How do you interpret a capacity rating. Um, I've seen that uh, quite often that actually the interpretation of capacity rating is pretty predictive of performance. Uh, what number does, do you set in a cultivation plan in ratio to that capacity I just got? Um, so identifying what are those things for training. This is all stuff we can be doing. Another area, and I just spoke with a, a bunch of presidents of alumni associations two weeks ago in Phoenix, and we spent a lot of time on net promoter score. That's real popular in alumni associations, uh, which is the, the Bain idea, uh, how likely are you to recommend our goods and services to your, um, your friends and family and so forth. And a lot of them, in each event, they measure a sort of net promoter score, how likely are you to uh, refer our university to potential students and so forth. Um, and a lot of them do engagement. So I've been starting to work on like actually intersecting those two. So some high NPS and high engagement, can we find truly meaningful volunteer roles to capitalize that? What if there's high um, uh, sentiment, but they're not engaged? How do we uh, get them involved? Um, it, these kind of these quadratic things, one thing I've learned, so this is, so I've probably averaged, I don't know, 30 to 40 presentations a year at conferences and so forth. And in those 30 to 40 per year, going on 12 years, I found when you speak on analytics, if you don't have a chart with two arrows and four boxes, someone always says something about it afterwards. They'll be like, you know what you should have? You should have something that has like these arrows and boxes and this quadrant, this, that. So I've just thought, I'm just gonna come with a quadrant and box thing every time. So this is actually the main purpose of that, so. But it's, it's cool stuff. Anyways, I'm moving on. Um, return on portfolio, this is something I've been spending a lot of time on because I think you can maximize return on portfolio just like you can maximize um, um, uh, gift potential or acquisition likelihood and so forth. And that is, what I like to do is basically a target zoning approach. So I think literally like a strike zone. Um, and we all know different characteristics. Let's use the kind of the common ones. So a major gift donor is going to have the capacity to give a major gift, right? We've got some level where we sign them. Uh, perhaps some predictive likelihood. Odds are if they have this, they, they yield at a higher rate. Maybe there's an engagement piece. Think of that as knees to the numbers, over the plate, certain speed. This is a strike zone pitch. When this is over the, over the plate, at the right height, at the right speed, maybe we have a certain batting average. When they're low and outside, or they're um, too high, too low, we miss more often. Um, think of it that same way, of, um, and box in. Here's our prospects that are in the strike zone. What do we do with those that are outside the strike zone? Maybe these, are, so this is an example of just engagement versus capacity. Can we move them over um, through integrating with um, 
um, other mass marketing type of concepts. Those that are below capacity perhaps don't make sense for a rollout, but just thinking about the criteria, who's our strike zone, and what I do is I, I look at all the criteria, and then I you look at that respective of close ratios. How well do we close gifts on those? Think of it as like just getting on base. But getting on base in this case is just that we're closing a major gift. What's the target zone for that? And what's our efficiency levels outside of that? Where is that zone where the cost makes sense, where it's not costing us more money to pursue these names? Then we want to evaluate whose in portfolio that fits that criteria versus who's out of portfolio that fits that criteria so that we know what we can do in terms of optimization. That work of identifying target zone, reviewing the portfolios, and then constantly rebalancing, I found will often do a bigger return in terms of fundraising uh, totals than even getting people to make more visits and ask more often. Oftentimes, who we're seeing has the bigger return. So portfolio work is definitely measurable and effective. The other is we're testing better. Um, our whole sector is doing a better job of studying data, um, identifying profiles, markets, clusters, testing the messages and events, um, deploying, evaluating, and, and recalibrating. Uh, perhaps a lot of you are doing some of that work right now. And then Game of Thrones, the only reason I mention it is because it's like almost here, and that's so awesome. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> are, are you Game of Thrones fans in here? Oh, yeah. I just thought we need a nice break from data to think about Game of Thrones coming back. All right, so moving on. <laughs> okay, and um, not much left. We'll leave some time for questions. Another area would be performance diagnostics. And performance diagnostics, which is very related to the report engineering I was talking about, is something we absolutely should be doing. And it's really cool stuff, and it's completely doable. What's occurred to me and what I've done with clients lately is looking inside is better than looking outside when it comes to benchmarking. And it hadn't occurred to me. But I thought, well, benchmarking, our, our industry loves benchmarking. Let's see what 10 other places like us are doing, and let's do that. Um, what's resulted from all this benchmarking over the last 20 years has been regressions to the mean in almost all of our major metrics. When I started in fundraising, it was not uncommon to see visit goals being 20 goal days a month. Now I'm seeing 10, and people think that's aggressive. I'm like, that's not an aggressive goal. But what's happened is everyone does 20 as their goal. That means everyone's average is 16. They do benchmarking. Oh, everyone's average visit 16. Our goal's too high. Let's set our goal to 16. Everyone says 16. We do benchmarking. Well, everyone's average is 13. Our goal's too high. Let's set it to 13. And then it keeps going down and down and down. And that happens quite often because common practices are not always best practices. However, what I have found, if I'm looking for performance, the truest thing that I can do, and this is usually where I focus, is looking inside an organization. So I've done this for a few organizations, some of you who are in this room, is I'll look at your top performers at your institution and everybody else. So like take, let's take just the major gift team. Here's a top major gift team and maybe a I mean, some universities have 150 or so major gift officers. Maybe you have 10 of them. But let's say this 150, I'll take out the top 20% um, by dollars raised. And it's often a Pareto effect. It's usually 80, 20% are raising 80% of the dollars. That's pretty normal. Uh, it's okay, embrace it. That's just how it works. But when we look at that, what's more powerful, I found, is if you're looking at all these performance things, how often do you visit, solicit, when in the relationship do you solicit, how high do you solicit, um, your cultivation timelines, all of these different performance data points, look at it just a pure comparison analysis between your top performers and everybody else. So those that raise 80% of the money, that 20%, they visit this many more times. They solicit, on average, this far from their first visit point. They're doing these things. And just from a baseline perspective, that is going to be so much more informative than you, than you realize, because there's, it's hard to take the excuses away on that one. Because usually, if you come up benchmarking, let me tell you why we're not Columbia, or why we're not Princeton. Let me tell you why we're nothing like the Nature Conservancy, or the Red Cross, or we're not anything like the Met, or, or the Houston Grand Opera. Um, that's usually what you hear in benchmarking. Um, but it's tough to say, let me tell you why I'm nothing like this gift officer who's doing a really good job. Like, oh, I don't want to say that because I'm not doing a good job, that means. Uh, and I don't say bring it down to people, but what the point of it is actually the metrics. Here's the metrics that we can measurably observe have a difference between those that perform more versus those that perform less. Then our KPIs aren't um, simply anything we can think to measure, but they're, here's the things that are distinguishing between high performance and low performance. That's a really important principle to understand um, because the reason our dashboards have become diagnostics um, is because we've come up with ways to measure more things. So we think, well, that must mean it's valuable to give more data. Uh, it's actually probably the reverse. It's harder to come up with less data as long as it's the right data. So I, I'm a big believer of your dashboard should be dashboards and your diagnostic analysis should be diagnostic analysis, but you shouldn't have all the detailed diagnostics be in the KPIs that we look at every day. 
So um, another thing that I've seen as a evolution, and I gotta leave some time for questions, right? How do I go till 10 to? So I mean, okay, all right, that's not too bad. Usually I talk too fast, no one can understand me. So it's always my favorite. Um, it's the most common on the evaluation forums. Um, it was great, it was exciting, he talks way too fast, I don't think I remember much of it. And, and I've tried so many ways, I mean I've tried how do you slow down? I've tried counting between things, taking deeper breaths. I even tried Ritalin, that didn't help, made it faster. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry, feel free to evaluate, he talks too fast, it's just, that's what you get, it comes with the, comes with the program. So anyways, moving back to very important stuff. The other thing I'm seeing in, in analytics that at least are part of prospect research departments is we're seeing an in, uh, increase of integrated distributive models for prospect development. And what that means is simply, uh, we've seen evolution from what was originally prospect research offices that were central point. You would make a request to the manager who would dole out um, all the work for the staff. It was kind of a central point and distributed research approach. Perhaps some of your uh, systems and your reporting areas are the same. And then we saw an evolution really in the 90s to liaison structures. And the liaison structure being, let's assign researcher to X number of gift officers. Um, so each, um, perhaps it's by college or unit, perhaps it's by um, uh, medical discipline and a healthcare or whatever, but here's the gift officers that are assigned to this researcher. What we started to see is uh, distributed models, and I like the whole Ocean's Eleven, because I think that's one of the best examples of a distributed model of a team, because everyone had certain roles and they all had to execute for that to work. And I'm seeing more of that in kind of research management analytics departments, where we have distributed roles of prospect ID, which are researchers that have the skill set to vet and make decisions, which is a different skill set. Some researchers are very effective at writing profiles, getting the facts, the details, and that's extremely valuable, especially as a pre-solicitation activity. But uh, pre-visit activity, we want it to be say yes or no with the limited amount of information. Who's good at doing that successfully? Um, so distributing that labor, the prospect management, the predictive analytics in a way that actually has an integrated process flow, kind of like a supply chain. Here's how we vet the random names down to names that we should be paid attention to. Here's how prospect ID pre-vets them, qualifies them, allocates them for assignment. Prospect management's um, mindful of who needs names, who doesn't need names, what types of names which person would take on. They get rolled out through a, an assignment process, research is maintaining. Oftentimes, there's still a hybrid li liaison model at that stage, which I, I think really works well, so that we have personal attention with the gift officers. But the way we're thinking the organizational structure and fundraising, this is just one example and created a distributed model for prospect development. But really across the board, how do names flow through our institution? What's the life cycle of a person, let's say we're in a university, the kid who first came to a basketball game with their parents, all the way to they were a student, to a graduate, um, uh, they came to a reunion for the first time, they gave their first gift, they gave their first major gift, they gave their planned gift, they died. What was that life cycle? What were the intervention points that the institution did to move them along that way? Are we organized such that we're in the entrance of advancing the life cycle of the constituent, or are we doing all the pieces from our benchmark that all the other universities do? That's, I think, where data can start to say, is here's how people move through, here's how we can study it, here's how we can do it better, and that's really cool stuff. And the last thing I wanna talk about is that very process itself. Moving from the who to the how, and that's what maybe a call that I want analytics professionals to start thinking about. Not just study who should we be seeing, but how should we be seeing them, because you can figure this stuff out. Capture the relationship management data, even if it's not much. You know, um, they have meetings, they met the president, they come to chalk talks. Um, what's the spacing between visits, the overall timelines, ratios, ratios between capacity and target ask amounts, their fall off on closing. Those of you that are big fans of Tufty, I often will do the Napoleon's March on their ratings. So we've got screening, then we've got the wealth capacity, then we've got the prospect ID vetting, then we've got the first rollout who's taken on for discovery. And then once they've done discovery, they set a target ask amount, they get to the actual solicitation, then they have the expected amount and then it's actually funded. That number goes from here all the way down to a little sliver coming back from Moscow in the French army. How do we, who's got a bigger sliver respective of each fundraiser or organization or research? Who's going from here to here? Who's going from here to here? Uh, what's that slope? Are there some that are staying level and then they drop off at solicitation? Are those that cut the, shoot themselves in the foot and then they're staying level? Can we push those shoot themselves in the foot a little bit up six months before solicitation and then their net would be a double in yield, all based on their pl planning being better? So studying some of the ratios on targeting, solicitation methods, and then take those that are successful closes versus unsuccessful and say, 
what of all these things that we do differently? Is there a higher rate of one thing than another so that when we can roll out names, we can say not only here's a new prospect, but here's a prospect, and when we've had this type of prospect, when we've done these six things in this order, we've closed at twice the rate when we haven't. Um, that's, I think, a new area where we can get to, where we're actually recommending based on observations. Sort of like, stop swinging at that outside pitch. You'd never connect on it. But you're just killing these inside, dropping, hanging breaking balls or whatever. Um, this is tough for me to use baseball. It seems like analytics people always want to talk baseball. I'd rather talk hockey. And maybe Andy and I can break off and talk some hockey later. Um, I'm a Minnesotan after all. Let's, oh, let's talk pond hockey. No, good. Stay on track. Um, Where's that riddle in anyways? Uh, <laughs> all right, so all I want to say then to close with is uh, for Frank Lloyd Wright, I think I go farther back. Sometimes the future is easier to look at the past. And he says, get the habit of analysis. In time, it will enable synthesis to become your habit of mind. So with that, thank you. <laughs>
great donors. So let's say 200 great donors, 200 random people, and then just take that data and start cross-tabbing between the two. Just line them up in Excel. Say, wow, there's more of these in the top donors, more of these in the non-top donors, and just look at the differences between the population. Now, you might not get p-values. You might not be able to, to prove the statistical validity of this. However, you're starting to see this are, these are things that are different between these populations. That's where I would start. And you can do that either through a survey, uh, if you've got a razor's edge, do a razor's edge query. Just have some field be for top donors, everyone else, and look at our attributes and look at how those things are different. That's one thing. Second, so if you're a smaller place that you think is maybe has potential to be a bigger place, what are we doing in terms of capturing coding and stuff so we can do this in the future? We might not have the investment right now, but if we invest in, um, in tracking prospect management, we're coding these things, we're tracking stages, we're time stamping relationships, we're actually putting our capacities in, maybe doing research data in the system. What that will enable us to do is we'll have a few years of data so when our organization has the ability to do that kind of um, investment, uh, we've got data so that we can do that. That's something that can happen small or large. So invest in the data, do some basic comparison projects. Even if you're, I know I'm a, a statistician um, and I love regression and I love to prove my data. I'm not as like most of us that are just opposed to point-based ranking systems. If that's what you can do is add some points for doing different things, do a point-based ranking system because what you're going to get from that is at least you're going to get business users starting to think about data helping me with decision making. And there is some value. People that do more stuff tend to do more stuff. So if we got more points, that's a good thing and it'll probably be somewhat successful. Or would a predictive model be better? Absolutely, it'd be more targeted, better for certain things, but um, you could do some uh, basic ranking, do some comparison, uh, data investment, that's I guess where I'd focus. As a follow-up, are there any data points that, that you advise younger institutions and smaller shops that they go after that in preparation for? Yeah. Um, if I do a short answer, things that people do are better than things that people are. So any Thing that it's an action. They've come to an event, they've participated on a board, they've done something, something that they've had to actually do something, responded to a survey. Try to capture those, because they're usually predictive. Um, I think about the stuff that's easy to get, job titles, throw job titles on reply cards. People will often fill that in. If someone says they're president of some major company, prospect research is a lot easier, because um, they're president of some company, right? Um, so some of those types of things. Events do make sense to start tracking that data because it's behavioral data. Uh, relationships between people are always valuable and they only get more valuable the more relationships you get. In fact, I've done so many planned gift models uh, over the years and, uh, and the kind of the old pillars are consistent giving and age, right? I'd say the only thing that consistently beats consistent giving and age for me is that there's multiple members of the same family that also give to the same institution. So actually, multiple connection points can be a real um, valuable thing. So I would perhaps invest there as well. Yep. Are we at time? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the drive.